Here we are at the Boston International Book Fair. It's November 17th, 2018. And we are about to interview Adam Weinberger. Um, Adam, tell us something about your family, your, your mom and dad, what they did. Do they go to school? Do you have siblings? Are you married, children? Give, give us a little biography, so well, to Sure, speak. it's just like writing a book description, right? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, well, my uh, father was born in Brooklyn. Uh, my mother was born in London. Uh, they met in uh, uh, 72. Uh, he was uh, somewhat older than my mother, 20-something uh, year difference. Uh, came back to New York, had me in New York. I'm uh, one of uh, four. I have uh, two sisters and, and a brother. I uh, haven't uh, emulated that large family yet. I have one child. One child. So you, when uh, did you get married? I got married in, uh, in Israel. In uh, two, when did I get married? I hope my wife doesn't see this. <laughs> I got married in uh, 2007. Uh, and you have one child? One child. A boy or girl? A girl. Age? Uh, she's five now. And are your parents still around? Uh, no, my father passed away about two years ago. Uh, my mother's uh, alive and well in Israel. Oh, she's living in Israel. Yes. Did your father live there too? Or, or uh, well, my, my Family sort of made Aliyah uh, uh, a while back, so uh, I s spent a, a number of years in Israel, uh, eight or nine years, something like that. Uh, met my wife there. Uh, she's Israeli. The whole family is there, so we try and go back and forth uh, to visit everybody. That's good. It, sometimes it's a little more dangerous than, than others, I would imagine. Well, it's all, all perception on TV and everything. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's right. Okay, so when did you first begin to think that books were something you wanted to do? Did uh, it come upon you one day like a, like a bolt? Well, hey, or they, it hits you on the head like, a, yeah, like a under hammer. the tree. Uh, well, that's different than something I want to do than necessarily I saw. I was interested in books uh, both for the uh, intellectual and commercial appeal. Uh, I would say very young. Uh, my uh, father originally was professor of uh, English. And I just grew up in a, a household of books. He wasn't necessarily a collector, but he, he bought antiquarian books, mm -hmm. and he was a big reader. And the house was always, always uh, full of books. filled with books. So. It's the same story. Everybody, everybody has that, that story. My parents read that books were in the house. Exactly, that's it. And you sort of like by osmosis, you sort of get like excited or, or interested. In yeah, well, uh, he was also a coin collector and other things, so objects of interest. So. You know, you get an appreciation of history and, and delving into all that uh, material. Um, he had a secret room where he kept things, and I was always, he told me the stories of like uh, the Thousand and One Nights, but he was the protagonist. <laughs> so, Sounds like a fun guy. Yeah, he was a, a, a wonderful father. Uh, but uh, in terms of actually getting into it, I would say when I was about uh, eight years old, uh, we moved back to London. Uh, for a period, and uh, my uh, father was working as an investment banker there, but uh, he started to buy libraries. He was always interested in books, and he had once bought, uh, uh, CB's was an old coin house, and uh, they were selling their numismatic library, so he bought a significant portion of that. And there was a manuscript in that library, uh, which he acquired, which was on the uh, weights of Roman coins. <coughs> Uh, and uh, he was interested in that because of his uh, coin collecting experience. But that manuscript actually turned out to be written by Isaac Newton. Wow. And it was when he was keeper of the Royal Mint. Uh, so I was completely fascinated. Like you could, one, get something uh, by Newton, but even make a discovery that, you know, otherwise knowledgeable people did not necessarily make. It was in like a commonplace book uh, mm. put together by uh, a man named John Arbuthnot, who was a... I know who he is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, dealt, he had a lot of coin books, and he must yeah. have gone to Newton and uh, you know, recorded this at the time. Uh, so that was fascinating to me, and I was pretty early on. Uh, then my uh, family moved down to Bournemouth. They got involved in a, a bookshop uh, in Bournemouth. There was an old store called Commons Bookshop, and my father had a lot of dealings with them. Uh, so I used to you know, rummage through their attics. Hang out. <laughs> yeah, I remember he... He was furious once because there was a three-volume set of uh, Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. I think it just says by a lady. 
Uh, yeah. And uh, with the, all the kids nagging him, he had to go back home, and he had to go back to the, the shop like an hour later, and it was gone. The triple decker of Austin was gone. So I got the first taste of losing out Money, on, yeah. on a major it, find. It, yeah, it, it, it can hurt. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, so I, I sort of understood the big book business. And uh, he was also very uh, good with me in terms of like his excess books early on when I was, I mean, like 13 years old. He says if I wanted to quote his numismatic books, his antiquarian, he didn't want any more, I could quote them to Mags or yeah. Quaridge. So I used to make up little <laughs> lists. I didn't say I was 13, but I yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, would type up the lists and send them along. So, And uh, they bought, I think, uh, not because of my bibliographical knowledge, but because of my low prices. Yeah, obviously. For, Price is everything. Yeah, so. Exactly. And well, condition is also pretty good. So that you, so now you're 13 years old. Now you're, you're hanging out uh, with various uh, books and stuff. Uh, when did you decide that this is what you wanted to do? So, it w well, it was a long path, I would say. You know, I always had something bookish in my life. You know, when I uh, was in high school, I worked for Bonmark Books, uh, which was out in Plainview. Uh, with Where was that a, located? In Plainview, on the mainstream, with uh, A. Blinderman, he was the oh, owner. Yeah. I, I barely remember yeah, that. Of, he was an old antiquarian. Yeah. He used to get a lot of very interesting material. He was a, a difficult fellow, <laughs> but, uh, at, at best. But, you, but you learn the material. So I worked there in, in college, in high school. Uh, I went to Stony Brook for undergraduate. Uh, I did nothing to do with books. I was uh, primarily uh, interested in math and science. I, uh, my uncle was a, an engineer, and he really trained me early on in, in math. So I was... Uh, fairly ahead and I, I left high school early. I started college relatively early. And uh, so I think I was 16 or so in college and uh, mostly doing math and uh, science. Uh, I did take a job also to get along. I was working for the book review out in Huntington yeah. uh, for a while. Uh, and uh, then uh, towards the uh, end of college, uh, you know, I, I did like a year abroad in Oxford, I, uh, things like that. But um, I sort of, I think that I was emotionally immature. Intellectually, I was mature for college, but I was emotionally immature. And consequently, I didn't know what to do or what to focus on. Uh, and I thought I would go into medicine, but I think on my med school interviews, they saw somebody who was not fully committed. <laughs> you know, I had great... Or should be committed. Yeah, I, I know I had great grades and everything like that, great test scores, but they sensed that this was a person who was not ready, for, and rightly so, I can't disagree at that time. Uh, so after college, I was a little bit lost. Uh, I opened up a bookstore in Huntington. Uh, it was originally meant to be a children's bookstore. I gave it a ridiculous name. <laughs> what was it called? Well, it came from a magic book, which uh, it was called Puff Your Frog. It was out of this magic trick. And I was going to do children's uh, uh, literature and things like that and toys and not necessarily antiquarian books. But uh, when I saw that business was not particularly going well and I had large inventories over the years of antiquarian books I had bought, I decided just to turn it into a more general bookshop, but the name didn't go away and confused everybody from <laughs> <laughs> for a couple of years. But I didn't uh, envision it as a long-standing business or anything like that. I used to go at night still to take you know other courses in physics and uh, then I applied to various graduate schools. I didn't know what I was doing in all sorts of fields. Uh, and Berkeley gave me an invitation uh, which to come to their uh, PhD program in uh, biomedical engineering. And even though I was not an engineer, I had not done any engineering, at, at least they paid for everything and yeah. gave you a stipend. It was a less risky opportunity than committing to medical school. Uh, so I went out to Berkeley in that program, and I was there for about five years or so, uh, mostly MRI design, CT, and things like that. But I, because I think I was not prepared uh, also for engineering, you really have to do four years of undergraduate. It was a big struggle. You got to go, Berkeley is the, uh, you know, one of the place. great centers, and you're competing at a very high level when Absolutely. you're at a slight disadvantage with your studies. But I always felt a little bit of a mediocre engineer. So, uh, after that, I decided uh, I moved to Israel, uh, you know, to be with family and everything. What and year was that? That was uh, about uh, 2000, 
something like that, 2001 okay. maybe. Um, I moved to Israel. I went to work for a venture capital firm. Uh, we did biotech investments, everything like that. Um, I didn't enjoy that so much because in Israel, when you're even though I could speak Hebrew and everything, when your English is perfect, uh, they sort of want to use you for fundraising and other. Absolutely, yeah. And, <laughs> you know, so they would send me to Paris and here and there for <laughs> not exactly what I signed up for. I, I wasn't uh, a fundraiser, but and so I didn't like that job, even though it was. By Israeli standards, a very yeah, good probably, job. Yeah. So I s went back to what I would think of as a hobby, uh, you know, which was dealing and trading antiquarian books, which I had always done. You know, I was even in Berkeley. I used to. I was good friends with Peter Howard at Serendipity, and he would always help me out. And it's always uh, a place to buy Jeremy books, Norman was very kind to Jerry's me. Jeremy's a good guy yeah. too. So I learned from very good dealers in California, uh, and they were uh, treated me very nicely, uh, and. So I sort of went back to uh, trading books a little bit on the side. I quit my job. I would go to Paris, to Germany, to London, and in the just in the days where you could still find things yeah. at auction, and not everything was as transparent as it is today, where right. you go to Lyon and everyone in the world sees what you bought and where. Right. So I could sell to American and European institutions, and I didn't envision it as necessarily a career change. It was just a temporary. Uh, change in, in path until I just figured out what I wanted to do, and, you know. But I don't know where. The, that, so the, I guess that was the real change where I started to consider more seriously becoming a bookseller. But I, I mean, I really did that full time, I would say, from about uh, 2001, 2002 on, just because I never went back into uh, an engineering or a finance career path. Uh, so. You were a guy who probably was au courant with the uh, internet. Mm -hmm. when, so it was an easy transition for you to put your stuff online, or did you have difficulties? Well, no, I mean, I was, uh, I mean, when they started uh, 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 A-Books, I mean, <laughs> I was like one of the first subscribers, I think, to that when they, when they did eBay in California, you know, because all my friends were working on the startups, and we were all in these engineering labs. You know, I worked with people who started Google and everything like that. Wow. So, Why don't you go with Google? Yeah, I should have. My, <laughs> my friend took a job in, in doing languages for Google. He was like employee number 20. I don't know where, where he is now, but he's not selling books. Uh, <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, so, yeah, like when eBay came out and they were very basic, uh, auction side, I used to list things on eBay, you know, uh, I, like everyone says, you should have uh, you know, invested in the stock and not uh, listed your stock. Uh, well, I think you did the right thing. So, I, I mean, I stuck with those venues. Uh, for most of the time, I mean, a lot of dealers knew me. Uh, I did, I was mostly a dealer's dealer. I mean, I would, yeah. I was always very reasonably priced. I prided myself on snuffing out stuff, finding good material, and moving it along uh, either to institutions or to dealers. And uh, the rest I would put online for auctions and things like that. And I still never was fully committed to uh, becoming a, a bookseller. I think I had like a, uh, everyone said, oh, you should join the ABA. You should become more serious. And I mean, I was doing well as, as a bookseller on the sidelines. and. Uh, I just was not psychologically uh, prepared, you know, uh, in my head that this was my destiny necessarily. Uh, so that held me back from uh, becoming a, uh, a more serious dealer for quite a number of years. Do you have an open shop, or do you, are you a mail order? No, uh, a mail order. I mean, I work out of a separate apartment. Uh, you know, have stock there and things like that. But so I mean, it's by I mean, appointment. Yeah, by appointment. I mean. New York City, so very tough to uh, yeah. get an open shop there. <laughs> I, I keep considering doing it outside, but uh, you know, it's logistics is difficult. Well, New York City is the place. Yeah, no, it, it's a fun place for books. You find stuff, you sell stuff. Uh, it's very chaotic. <laughs> very chaotic. Yeah. Um, who were some of the people who uh, were sort of like mentors or people who guided you along the way? In terms of the book business? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, w I didn't specifically have any mentors, I wouldn't say, uh, later on. I mean, I had good relations with dealers. Like, for yeah. example? Uh, well, I, I mean, I used to always frequent shops in, in England, in Mags, in Quaritch, and 
uh, you know, some of the German dealers. And when I came to New York, as I became more serious, I think like some of my dealer friends like uh, Dan Wexler at Sanctuary and David Bergman and, and people in the, the New York community of books yeah. uh, uh, started to uh, open up more to me as they saw me more at the auctions. And then I started to become uh, good friends with everybody, you know, and they sort of pulled me more seriously in the direction of joining the ABA. They, they more pushed you, uh, probably. Well, hook, line, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you see as some of the big challenges that face are we booksellers as, as we move forward? Uh, well, there's, I mean, obviously the bookselling world has changed completely. I mean, it's changing continually. Uh, and uh, obviously, I think the single most thing is not only affects books, but I see it in other trades, the antique business and everything. It's just the focus of people's attention on things like the iPhone. They're totally consumed uh, in the digital world. And, you know, you get it even worse as you get younger. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, people just don't have an interest in the physical object and handling the physical object. They're interested in the uh, digital uh, picture of it and sharing it and things like that. So that's going to be an increasingly difficult thing to overcome. Uh, also, I think uh, just in the book trade itself, of course, that, uh, you know, the experienced dealers, just by the very nature of handling material, uh, as they accumulate more capital and get more experience, they want to handle rare and rarer material and things they haven't seen. And of course. Of course. And they're just not a lot of antiquarian dealers. Uh, so you see the destruction of the middle market. You know. God, there used to be 50, 75 booksellers in New York City. I remember Fourth Avenue. It used to take me two days to go through Fourth Avenue to mm -hmm. all the booksellers that used to be there. And, uh, the, the world has changed. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, it's incumbent a little bit, I mean, to get people enthusiastic. You know, book fairs are important, but uh, there, there should be as many friendly opportunities besides book fairs, you know, to get people to handle books, to, you know, buy and sell things. Are you, you know. part of the Mac chapter? Uh, no, I'm not. I think I should, actually, I, sh I shouldn't say yes or no. I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> I don't think I'm... Uh, uh, yeah, but you're an ABA member yeah. from New York City. So, so I think it's be, part of the you're, Mac, you're, yeah, you're automatically. Yeah, yeah. You, sh you should start a, you, you should start going to some of the chapter meetings. They have, like, a couple of times a year. You get to, get to see a lot of people on a different plane that you mm -hmm. might see them in a shop to deal sure. situation and I've always found that to be pretty interesting yeah I have to uh, everything is time you know <laughs> so you really got serious what about five or six years ago this is going to well be I was doing uh, like I said books full-time since about 2002 but I would say uh, about uh, yeah five years ago I said okay you know what I'll become uh, an established uh, ABA member you know uh, especially because I think it I was writing institutions and everything, and they started to write me as well, you know, uh, as they started to have, uh, you know, provenance issues with, you know, like it, they always had provenance issues with antiquities and other fields, uh, you know, that you'd see arrests of uh, dealers and Indian artifacts in New York or something. And some of that has been increasingly creeping into the book world, where I used to freely trade in manuscripts, and now there's so many export licenses and, and things And forgeries. That, yeah, well... A forgery is less so, but more provenance is this. I, I don't deal in modern manuscripts, which are easier to forge, but yeah. older material is very difficult to forge. But the provenance is a, is a big thing, and where it came from, and was it legally exported for a lot of institutions, uh, and questions about theft and everything like that. And they would want uh, somebody who was in the ABA who had some uh, established credibility to back what they were selling. Not only, not necessarily that that. Uh, is the umbrella for all honest people, but uh, it does give the librarians some cover that they bought it from a known dealer rather than you know somebody private or uh, somebody who's not uh, well recognized. Tell us about the kinds of things that you deal in. Uh, uh, everything to turn a dime into a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> you know? No specialty. No, I'm a generalist. Uh, I think. I mean, I have a love of early printing. I have a love of early manuscripts, uh, but. Uh, you know, I think if you want to do well in the book trade today, especially for younger people, it's very difficult to specialize. You know, uh, there's only so much material, there's only so much rare material, and if you confine yourself to one particular area, you can quickly <laughs> run out of yeah. 
of uh, uh, sellers and buyers. Uh, but just intellectually, I'm always interested in expanding my knowledge in different fields. So, and I really, uh, fundamentally, what I find enthusiastic about the book business is not necessarily the transaction, but I, I like to find fresh material. The hunt. Right. Yeah, yeah, the hunt, the discovery. I mean, that's really the thrilling aspect for yeah, me. Yeah, it is. It's for, uh, every yeah. bookseller, I think, would feel the same way. Yeah, so once you keep dealing in the same thing over and over and over again, it's just not, not right. Yeah, and I really like the stories of the people who sell the books and everything. Well, this is one of the reasons that we started this project, is to get people's stories and have them permanently on film mm -hmm. at the Grolier Club so that, you know, maybe a hundred years from now, some dude's going to come along and say, who was so-and-so? They'll be able to go to the Grolier and see a, a whole video of what book selling was worth and like in this century. Sure. It's very important, I think. Um, one more question I want to ask you. Uh, do you find yourself in New York, um, are you able to find material in, in the city, or do you have to you know, go far out? And well, I mean, I do find a lot of material in the city. Uh, I mean, despite all these libraries dispersed over the years, you still get calls from yeah. interesting libraries. Uh, there is also, as, even though it's a competitive environment in books for the city, uh, there's a, a surprising number of books and libraries with no place to go because right. there are very few bookshops. And if you're willing to do the, the work of going to an entire library to you know, sort it out or look for gems, there's not so many people who are, yeah. you know. And the established dealers, I mean, that's an age factor. I mean, it gets tiring for them to go house to house and apartment to apartment. and. It can be a very exhausting work. Especially in yeah. a big city like New York. Yeah. But of course, I mean, I'll uh, go anywhere, you know, that I get a call from. <laughs> yeah, anywhere for a book. <laughs> no, I, I do. I travel pretty widely. I mean, not just the tri state area, but I mean, I'll, I, you know, went down to South Carolina a few weeks ago to look at some uh, small library. I flew to Palm Beach quickly to look at a library. You know, if there's an opportunity, uh, try and take them. So. What, uh, how, much, how many items do you have in your inventory? Approximately. Uh, in the in, in my, I probably have uh, three, four thousand books or something on that order. And are they all online? No, I'm not very big with listing online. I'm not. Occasionally, I do it. I should, on one level, it would make more sense for me commercially. I guess one, it's time constraints, uh, and every dealer does it, but. Uh, for me, I find <laughs> as soon as I list it online, it's even harder to sell. Really? I like keeping the stuff sort of fresh, being a little bit different. When people buy from me, they don't have to check eight books and ask me to take it immediately off. And yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, time flies. Sure. We've, we've just done a, a neat 30-minute interview with you, and I appreciate your participation. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs>